So today what I want to talk about is Charles I and the road to the wars, uh, most likely uh, the wars of course here are referring to the, um, the civil wars that England took under took. And really we will go back a little bit before the time period um, of Charles I and James just to round out a couple of things because they set us up I think really for the situation that will be repeated again and again during the time of Charles the First. Now I've got um, this lovely slide here, which I'm going to take down simply because uh, I want to actually have it as a as a beginning um, for the YouTube thumbnail, and not very much else. So I'm going to stop the share there. Um, but really, uh, what we are looking at here is um, the fact that James the First, um, Charles, the Charles the First um, father here. Um, is in negotiations with um, the, well, he's negotiating a marriage for Charles I with the Infanta Maria, who is seen as this possible wife for Charles I. Uh, and this is generally unpopular with England because the war with Spain in 1588 uh, is still fresh in some people's memories. Now, obviously, it's, it's not for everybody because um, that had happened quite some time before. But it was still there, and she was Catholic, and there was uh, Catholic agitation on the continent against Protestants. This didn't tend to go down very well in England, and it didn't go down well in popular. Uh, didn't go down popularly in Parliament as well. Um, there was a group set up around a man called Edward Coke who petitioned for a war with Spain for Charles I to marry a Protestant, and for the enforcement of the anti-Catholic wars. James is very unhappy with this, and egged on by his chief, um, I suppose, confidant, um, Buckingham, um, he dissolved Parliament because he was unhappy with this. And in a way, this isn't really that strange. Kings can call and, I suppose, uh, dissolve Parliaments at their whim. Uh, this is nothing that is outside his powers. He's, he's not abusing. But James dies um, on March the 27th in 15, sorry, in 1625. And there's a couple of events that happen in quite quick succession, which I'm going to run through simply because this is really why we kick off the, the two, well, kick off the civil wars. In April 1625, um, Charles, as is normal, goes to Parliament to ask for some money. Um, he's involved in the Palatinate Wars and he needs about £700,000. And Parliament at this point refuses him and only gives him one hundred and twelve. I may have talked about it in previous classes where Parliament gives certain taxes over certain areas um, as an income stream for the monarch. In this case, it's tonnage and poundage. Um, this, they attempted to only give him tonnage and poundage uh, for only one year. Um, and this fails to go through the House of Lords. And Parliament also begins to investigate Buckingham for his efforts into the war as well, which won't look good uh, if it comes out against. In, 16, in uh, September 1625, so uh, three or four, about four or five months later, Buckingham negotiates with the French um, to aid them in the war against the Huguenots, who are Protestants, in return for help. Uh, retaking the Palatinate, and Parliament is absolutely horrified at this prospect of Protestants fighting against Protestants, which fuels this accusation of crypto-Catholicism against Buckingham. Um, and by so, I suppose, in a certain way, Charles I, even though that may not be said out loud. Um, in November 1625, Buckingham attacks Cadiz, which is uh, a Spanish port, We're trying to reenact. Um, the attack of the port is done by Sir Francis Drake during the reign of Elizabeth I. And um, the point, the idea, at least, was to go in there, attack, burn the ships, and then sail away, hopefully being some sort of hero. The men were ill-disciplined. Uh, unfortunately, near the entrance of the port, they found a warehouse full of wine and got drunk in typical English fashion. And that's continued throughout the centuries, a long tradition of Englishmen going to Spain and getting blind drunk. Parliament tries to impeach Buckingham for this. Um, and Charles likes Buckingham and he won't have anything to do with it. So he dissolves Parliament so he can't. Two years later in 1627, um, Charles raises forced loans. So 
he needs money. Parliament doesn't appear to be giving him any, or hasn't given him any. So he he forces people to give them loans, or wishes to force people to uh, raise loans. And um, seventy people are arbitrarily jailed for refusing Charles in this respect. And five of them petition the court of the King's Bench. Um, one of the long-standing parts of most Anglo-Saxon-based um, law systems is this idea of habeas corpus. Um, you, you can't just randomly jail people without a trial, so to speak. Um, there are technicalities, legal technicalities, uh, which are still in place today. And so Parliament um, and others begin to question the, these legality of these enforced loans. And Charles I gets scared about this. He uh, refused to continue to press charges. And as a consequence of this, more wealthy landowners refused to pay these forced loans that Charles was attempting to levy on people, and a new parliament was called called in March uh, 1627. In July 1627, Buckingham uh, went to La Rochelle, which is in France, um, to help the Huguenots uh, who were besieged there and lost somewhere between four and seven thousand men. It was incredibly badly supplied um, uh, in the process, and. He came back to England and he was organizing a second campaign in August um, 1628 when he was assassinated by a man called John Felton, which um, I think in some ways uh, hurt Charles an awful lot. And um, I don't think Charles was ever really truly uh, happy with the, with, the, with, the, with the loss of what was his sort of great friend confidant. So, what do we have in 1628 is what we call the Petition of Right, and this was a list of um, requirements by Parliament, really, and they presented them towards Charles and said, look, here are the basic rights that we have, and you should not be transgressing these, and they are as, followed, as follows. Um, firstly, that there should be no taxation without the consent of Parliament. Secondly, that there should be no imprisonment without shown cause. That's the habeas corpus problem that we had. Um, a little earlier. Thirdly, that there should be no billeting of soldiers or sailors upon the householders against their wills. You can't barrack people, you can't just wander up and barrack people in somebody's house uh, unless if they uh, wish you to. And fourthly, there should be no martial law to punish ordinary offences by soldiers or sailors. Um, so they present this um, as the British of Right in front of Charles. In 1629, in March, the House passes resolutions against religious innovations. They grant tonnage and poundage, but only for one year. And Parliament is again dissolved by Charles. And in 1537, uh, so we've now got uh, sort of a few years, eight years afterwards, in Scotland, um, Charles I, in conjunction with Archbishop Lord, attempts to impose a new liturgy. And there are riots as priests um, are supposed to read from the new um, Book of Common Prayer. And in response to this, Scots raise up a, a what's called a National Covenant um, in 1581. Uh, there was this covenant and they revived it again in, in 1637, which said that basically we are going to stick to religion as it was in 1580. There shouldn't be any innovations in religion. While they also affirmed loyalty to the king, they said that we're not going to do things in the way that you wish. So what we're beginning to see is a split in how Charles, well, first between Charles and the Parliament, but also in terms of how religion is, ex how, what people were comfortable uh, doing religiously. And Charles I wishes to impose his particular version of, of Anglicanism across the United Kingdom, or at least most of the United Kingdom, and the Scots are having absolutely none of it. And in 1538, the Glasgow Assembly, which is a, a group of people, um, up in Scotland, nullified all the previous general assemblies, um, saying that they were dominated by bishops and kings. They declared unlawful this new prayer book, which they had been asked to use. Um, they declared unlawful episcopacy, which is the idea that you have bishops. And they also outlawed um, the, the Book of Canons. And they raised an army against Charles I, and this starts what we call the, um, the Bishops' Wars. This is the first Bishops' War. And Charles' plan in the Bishop's War really was to attack from the south, uh, which is fairly obvious if you go up to Scotland, you sort of want to go up. Uh, and that's pretty much the, the, the most easiest way to attack in Scotland. 
Um, but his idea was he would attack from the south and the Earl of Antrim would attack from Ireland. And the Marquis of Hamilton would sail behind the lines and the Scottish royalists would all attack from the highlands. So in other words, everything would sort of um, centre into the middle of Scotland and they'd be attacked on all sides. In uh, March 1539, um, Alexander Leslie, uh, one of the Scots, captures Edinburgh. Um, Charles rides for York, which is up in the north of England, and he doesn't have a particular large army base, and he doesn't really have an army at all in many ways. He revives a uh, medieval practice of summoning nobles uh, who were supposed to provide soldiers, and they were not pleased with this at all. But they did it, or at least mostly did it, and he ended up going to Scotland with 18,000 men, but they were all raw recruits. They were not trained soldiers in any way. The Marquis of Hamilton, who uh, was supposed to sail behind the enemy lines and also attack, also had the same problem. He didn't have a, a decent enough army, and they were also raw recruits, and they couldn't land anywhere due to covenanted presence. So in, 15, in 1639, in May 1639, Charles offers a truce um, because the Covenanters are advancing. It scares the English. Um, they think there are many more Covenanters than there really are. And Charles is very unnerved and he decides to negotiate with the Covenanters. And we end up in June 1639 at what is called the Pacification of Berwick, which is very important. And they agreed that um, everybody would disband their armies. Uh, the Scots churches would be governed by assemblies, which is Presbyterianism as opposed to Episcopacy, which of course is the um, preferred system of Charles I. Charles was to authorise a general assembly of the Kirk of the church. And um, that kind of sort of finishes us in the First Bishop's War. Um, but it doesn't last for very long. Um, that's in 1639. Um, in 1640, we start all over again, pretty much. Um, Charles is absolutely determined to subdue the Covenanters by force. Um, he summons a man called Thomas Wentworth, who is created the Earl of Stratford, who is granted funds to raise an Irish army. And Thomas Wentworth suggests that Charles summons Parliament for money, because he needs money. This is the, the perennial problem for the Stuarts. And so he calls what's called the Short Parliament, um, in April 1640, which only lasted three weeks. Um, and the problem was that Parliament really wasn't interested in talking about war. Um, they were essentially arguing about the legality of the dissolution of Parliament in 1629 and of Charles's imprisonment of MPs who disagreed with him. And they refused all money until this is all sorted out. Charles is pressed for time, so he marches north. Um, and again, uh, people are, the southern levies are raised, in other words, people are forced into, into the army, essentially. Um, these are largely undisciplined, many of them desert, they are prone to immunity as, uh, as well. Um, sorry, mutiny, not mutiny. Mutiny. Um, two Catholic officers were lynched by their own men, and Wentworth, who was supposed to be attacking from, the, uh, from Ireland, wasn't ready yet. Now, in Scotland, the Scottish Parliament had ordered the sub subduing of royalist lands, and the Earl of Argyll had gone around burning and pillaging them to subdue them uh, in, in, quite horrific, uh, in quite horrific fashion. Um, for those of you who I think might be, um, if any of you have been watching Game of Thrones, which you shouldn't, but uh, I believe, I think, if I'm correct, um, that sometimes uh, G.R.R. Martin, um, Martin, I think it is, um, he takes some of his historical um, inspiration from some uh, from his period. Uh, anyway, so back to the Scottish Parliament. So they're, they're, they're subduing the royal the royalist lands. Um, the Scottish Parliament still has regiments from the first bishops' war. Uh, if you remember, one of the things that they were supposed to do was to disband armies. Uh, they still had some. Um, and 20,000 of them were raised and placed on the board ring with England. And they had trouble supplying them because, of course, an army is only as good as its supply chain. So they decided that an offense was better than defense because it might be easier to pick up supplies as you invade England, and that's exactly what they did in August the 20th, 1640. So it's invasion time. And the Scots, I suppose, in cunning fashion, simply avoid all the heavily English fortified towns. And instead, they head for um, the, well, they head to a place what will, with what will end up being the Battle of Newburn in August of 1640. The English were 
poorly placed and the Scots simply went around them. The English deserted under fire because they were not um, well trained and they fled back to Newcastle. Um, the English general, uh, Viscount Conway, decided that Newcastle was uh, not defendable and so it disappeared. And this pretty much destroyed the English morale. And so we end up a bit like the 1639 pacification of Berwick. We end up in 1640 in October of something called the Treaty of Ribbon. Um, and this is, again, Charles organized the truce, which argued for the cessation of hostilities. They were going to decide permanent settlement in the near future. Um, the Scottish army was occupying Northumberland and Durham, uh, levying 850 pounds a day from the English government for a quarter. And the Scots wished to be reimbursed for their expenses during the war. And so a year later, in the Treaty of London, in August 1641, Charles summons the Long Parliament. Um, with the, well, the Long Parliament sits from 1640 to 1648 and has all the same problems as the Short Parliament did. They were angry with what they perceived as the personal rule of Charles I, um, who was doing things essentially without asking Parliament. Um, and the Long Parliament also pushed other reforms. They wanted, and these are important reforms because they are, I suppose, raising this idea that Parliament is an important thing that requires or is a requirement for ruling. And this is very important to note. Uh, this is what, uh, this is a new thing. So Parliament has to meet every three years and it cannot be dissolved without its own consent. Um, they wanted to abolish prerogative courts and they wanted to declare the collection of non-parliamentarian taxation as illegal, because this is how Charles was raising money, and they wanted that to stop. Uh, they also introduced, or wished to introduce something called the Root and Branch Bill, which called for the removal of bishops from the Church of England, uh, which was also a kind of a reform along Scottish lines, which was Presbyterian. Scottish commissioners were welcomed by Puritans in England, and Charles denounced them as rebels. And Charles has a bunch of other problems. Um, Archbishop Lord and Strafford were both impeached by Parliament. And he sues for a quick peace and concedes a number of things. Uh, firstly, that the Scottish General Assemblies that banished Episcopacy were to be ratified, that the royal castles of Edinburgh and Barton were to be defensive early. Um, the other problems were that nobody paid for signing the covenants. They wished all captured Scottish goods to be returned, all anti-covenanter publications to be suppressed, and the Scots were to get £300,000 as recompense. Parliament officials a brotherly recompense. It's a bit cheeky, but kind of funny, not best. So that's kind of like the brief, the brief outline of Charles's sort of issues. And I'm just going to sort of uh, come into really what is called the War in Three Kingdoms. Those are sort of the bishops' wars, but now we end up with what's called War in Three Kingdoms, mostly because it controls the Irish, the Scottish, and the English. So we have essentially two civil wars. And um, the first one is from uh, 1643 to 1646, and the other one is 1647 to 69. I won't talk very much about them because there's a lot in it uh, that isn't necessarily relevant, um, but I'll just run through them very briefly to see what happens. And that way you're sort of up to date, but at least a rough idea of what's happening during this time period. So in uh, the First Civil War in 1643, um, peace terms are sent towards uh, Charles I to disband his armies, um, to accept the Triennial Act. Remember, the Parliament asked uh, to be called every three years. That's called the Triennial Act. Uh, Charles I must call Parliament. And Charles refuses. Um, and he calls for the return of all munition, munitions and ships and towns, etc. Um, Parliament says, if it goes to the hands, we'll do this, if it goes to the hands of the people we trust, and Charles I refuses, so talks collapse. And then Parliament raises forces, and then the attack. The Earl of Ormond, at the time, sorts out a treaty which frees the Irish from rebellion, and allows them to fight for Charles I, which puts a lot of suspicion on him. Um, it doesn't really affect very much, um, but it's a PR loss, because it looks like you are... Um, well, well, it depends which side you're looking at. You're either rebelling um, against Charles, or you're uh, sorry. You're either you're either um, if you're supporting Charles, you're essentially supporting a monarch, but you're also acting in Parliament's eyes as, as being traitors, and that's not to be pleased with. 
there is also the introduction of something called the Solemn League Covenant, which allows the Union of Scots and English, which uh, they sort of put out the idea that this is uh, an umbrella with which you can fight for, quote, the reformation of religion according to the word of God. Now, that quote, reformation of religion according to the word of God, um, could mean almost anything. And this allows multiple interpretations, which of course is brilliant at one level, because it allows many people uh, across the religious spectrum to consider themselves to be part of it. We're all fighting for the religion according to the word of God. But of course, how that actually is expressed may be something else. Some Scots are very suspicious of this. That's not great. In 1644, uh, the tide turns against Charles, and so the Scots push towards York. Charles's Western army is destroyed, and on July the 2nd, we have the Battle of Marston Moor, which ends the Northern Royalist hopes. Cromwell um, introduces the self-denying ordinance, which removes all MPs from holding command in the army and creates what's known the, as the New Model Army. This is a national army which could serve anywhere, which would be paid by Parliament and wouldn't have any MPs in it, it would only be professional service, professional soldiers only. So we have, if you like, the creation of, of a modern army. In 1645, we have the Battle of Naseby, which is the destruction of uh, Charles I's main army. 14,000 parliamentarians fought 8,000 of Charles I's uh, men. It was actually a close battle. Um, but then there were subsequent losses in the West Country, in the West Country. And in January um, 1645, Charles tried to recruit people from Ireland. Um, he sends the Earl of Glamorgan with religious concessions to the Irish Catholics in return for 10,000 troops. Um, this ultimately embarrasses Charles, uh, and he discerns what Glamorgan has done. Um, he doesn't, he doesn't um, accept this. Uh, these religious concessions at all, and that's just, that's what something he was doing on his own accord. And on 1646, um, May the 5th, Charles I turns him in, um, because the war has gone absolutely terrible. Um, there's a rebellion in Ireland, the King's men can't get support there, Charles has all these problems in the south of England, and so he just stopped. And so there is a, a lull, in, a lull, I suppose, in a way. Um, until we get to the Second Civil War in 1647, where Charles I promises the Scots um, some secret concessions if Scotland is to invade, if Scotland was to invade England to put Charles I on the throne. And he would say, um, he sort of essentially allowed them the establishment of Presbyterianism for three years. So that's the deal. Put me on the throne, we'll have some Presbyterianism for three years. There is a royalist outbreak in Wales in April. Um, the army outlook sees all of this as Charles going against God. Uh, there are numerous outbreaks of unrest all the way around the country, but they're very uncoordinated. So the new model army of Cromwell keeps going around the country and putting out these fires, which is, uh, I suppose, it's acting in the way that it actually should. In 1648, um, Parliament negotiates in September what's called the Newcastle Propositions. And Charles agrees to this in October, that Parliament will control the militia, there won't be an, an uh, there won't be any abolishment of bishops, but the episcopacy will be suspended for three years. So we're kind of like halfway between what he was uh, promising uh, the Scots in a way. Now the new model, new model army sees this as a betrayal of Parliament and wants Charles the first brought to justice. Um, and in December um, they push for this by doing something called Pride's Purge, where they arrested forty five MPs. Others were removed from Parliament, others were withdrawn in protest, which leads what's called the Rump Parliament. Um, and this brings the, uh, this is the Rump of Parliament, other people willing to uh, bring the, uh, the King to trial. So um, that's kind of like the brief outline of it. Now the outbreak, the out, uh, sorry, the outbreak of the wall is a lot more um, sort of complicated. And I do want to talk a little bit about this now in a bit more detail. Uh, so we're actually going to backtrack, so to speak, um, a little bit, uh, just sort of see to the outbreak of the war. Um, so Parliament really looked as if it had won. At many points, it looked as if it had won, because Charles's religious innovations had been reversed. Um, various people who were on Charles's team, so to speak, the Earl of Strafford, William Lord, 
um, had been either executed or put into the Tower of London. Parliament had been given the Triennial Act. And so the question is, why did war break out? Now, the question might be, and how long is a piece of string? Um, but really, it's all about the lucky charms in Ireland. Uh, and this really is, is where, my, I suppose, many of the problems start, which is in Ulster in Ireland. Um, if we go back to the 1590s, the Earl of Tyrone had rebelled against Elizabeth I, and land had been confiscated from him and given to plant Protestants. So they were replanted, so to speak, with English and Scotsmen, and relationships were not going too well there. The Irish chieftains had seized control of the Irish government, and they wanted to negotiate for a better settlement, much like the, Scots, uh, the Scottish Covenanters had done um, in Scotland. But the rebellion had gotten out of control. Settlers were killed, lands were seized, and they were joined by the old English aristocracy in Ireland, um, who were essentially, I suppose, descendants of the Normans, primarily Roman Catholics, and very frightened of a Puritan parliament. About 4,000 people were killed in this. Uh, many thousand, more thousands died from cold and hunger. And then the rumours began to hit London, which were generally wildly exaggerated. Um, this idea that there was some sort of popish plot maybe going on. Um, all of this was lies, but it confirmed a Catholic conspiracy. The question was, well, how do we deal with this problem in Ireland? Charles needs to raise an army. Um, the question is, who do we trust with it? Um, how do we know he's not going to raise an army and attack Parliament? And so John Pym, in what's called the Great uh, Remonstrance, uh, November 23, uh, 1641, um, argues that, well, firstly, he presents a catalogue of Charles I's errors, but that Parliament should choose um, Charles I's councillors. And there should be an assembly to, to determine the structure of the Church of England. This was to satisfy the Puritan zealots. They have this huge, massive, massive debate about this until two o'clock in the morning. It passes uh, by only about, uh, I think it's uh, 11 votes. Um, and so the Great Remonstrance is, is, is passed, and it's printed, and it's handed out, um, and it divides absolutely everybody. Because previously, everybody had been against Charles I, but now it splits Parliament because it confirmed to some people in Parliament that there was an attack on the ancient constitution and monarchy. And others didn't want a Puritan assault on the Church of England. And Charles is not a great fan of this great remonstrance either. He gives him something to rally people around him. And then he stupidly comes to Parliament to arrest the leaders of the House of Commons with upon treason charges. And they all had warning that Charles was on his way and had disappeared. And Charles I was rumoured to have murdered all my birds have flown uh, when he got there because there was nothing there. Parliament begins to empty, people go back to their estates. Um, Henrietta uh, Marie, his wife, uh, leaves for France to consult with Louis XIV to raise money to buy arms for a royal army. So that's 1641. And then 1642, uh, we have um, in March, we have the Militia Ordinance, which was the right to raise troops and commanders, and this legisl legislature requires Charles I's signature, and so Parliament legislates it without it. Then they also introduced what's called the 19 Propositions. These were offered to Charles I. Um, Parliament is to approve, as they had previously suggested, that they uh, appoint the Privy councillors, the major state officers, and they should be in charge of raising the militia and the commanders. And um, the King was to accept Church of England changes that Parliament had made. This is quite a big chunk of things to change. And Charles responds, uh, quote, the total subversion of fundamental laws and excellent constitution of this kingdom. Parliament was never intended for any share in the government or in the choosing of them that governed. This is quite true. Um, if we sort of look at the way that um, society was structured and had been structured for a long time. There was no way that Parliament would sort of get away with this. Um, how dare they come along and ask for all these things? It's not it's not there for them to do it. And I suppose this is a big, massive uh, crack in the facade, I suppose, uh, of, of governing at this time. Um, the problem at the time was that most both, both sides appealed to what's called the ancient constitution. And well, England doesn't have a written constitution. It has this sort of uh, mystical thing in the background um, that 
that it's never written down. And like an American constitution where things are written down, you can read it. There's no such thing in the English constitution. It's just a, a bunch of stuff that kind of...